This episode is brought to you by Meta for Work. It's not just sci-fi anymore. Virtual and mixed reality are transforming how business works. Architects can use mixed reality to walk through buildings that aren't even built yet. People from around the world can meet up in more immersive ways, working shoulder to shoulder in virtual spaces to get real work done. And all sorts of professionals are getting hands-on training in safer, more cost-effective virtual environments. Meta for Work. Work smarter, closer, safer, together. Visit forwork.meta.com to learn more. My name is Aram. My pronouns are he, him. I'm the creator of the actual play Dungeon and Dragons podcast, God's Fall. My name's Dylan. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm a physicist from Canada. Welcome to Kill Every Monster. In this episode, we are featuring oozes. The monster manual states that oozes thrive in the dark, shunning areas of bright light and extreme temperatures. They flow through the damp underground, feeding on any creature or object that can be dissolved, slinking along the ground, dripping from walls and ceilings, spreading across edges of underground pools, and squeezing through cracks. The first warning sign an adventurer receives of an ooze's presence is often the searing pain of its acidic touch. <laughs> We are joined by Wally. Wally is a personality in the TTRPG scene featured on many different streams and shows. They are a constant feature on the Gnome Brew Morning Show, four-time TTRPG GIF nominated player, and your internet best friend. Welcome to the show, Wally. Four time. Four time. Robbed. Four times. Four time. Four time. TTRPG GIF nominated. By the way, that's only one year alone that I've been calling. Oh, cool. Well, yeah, that's... So. Oh, that's different. I thought I thought you were coming back and taking an L every year like Angela Lansbury. <laughs> yeah, it's totally different. Yeah. Hi, thank you for having me here today, guys. Oh, thank you for coming out. God, I'm excited for this. I've been looking forward to this. I have been looking forward to this for a while now. Like ever since we first talked about it, I was like, finally I get to talk about my favorite monsters on the podcast. And I am excited to do that. Then tell me about your favorite monsters, Wally. What is an ooze? An ooze, oh boy, an ooze. Um, so when you we already went for the, what the monster manual described ooze as. Oozes are basically these gigantic, made of gelatinous or jelly or acid or something that people get stuck in and they just get eaten away. They are these just these living organisms that just melt things away and consumes them. To me, um, I always viewed an ooze as like. What if the planet had a white blood cell? What if like the planet had a white blood cell that whenever something foreign touched the surface of it, something was all like ready to go like, oh no, no, you're not supposed to be here. Let's go take care of that. That's what I think oozes are. Oozes are basically like, cause if you look at um, the way the monster manual describes the way DMG describes oozes, how you can trace it back to some really like infernal legacies and everything. I always felt that oozes are a natural thing created by this plane, the plane that, you know, the game takes place in. Yeah. Because there were too many, like, people showed up because people just don't happen. People aren't there. Like, something caused these people to show up here. But there was probably a time before that there were no people. So I feel like that oozes are kind of like that, something that was there before people even showed up, that was kind of, like, acting as a like a self-defense mechanism for the planet because it can't take care of itself. Out, It can't take care of itself. So why not create an organism that can take care of the planet for it and just eliminate anything that tries to hurt it? That also stands up really well because they call out the different kinds of oozes consume different materials. Like the black ooze can eat wood and bone. Gelatinous cubes don't eat metals. Gray ooze specifically does... It has the corrode metal ability. Ochre jellies don't got anything specific, but they split. That's fun. The weave is described as this thing that literally wraps the world. It exists around the world. So magic is this physical part of the world. If magic is a physical part of the world, it would have to feature into the ecology. If these things are byproducts, they maybe feed off the magic or they were born from, or maybe it just created other creatures so that these hyper evolved into this thing. Like it, it, it makes a lot of sense for oozes to just be a part of this world. They're just a homeostasis. Yes. 
a like, terrible one. That, yeah. <laughs> that is, that's the whole mindset. Yeah, because when you think of it like that, it's the way oozes are described. You cannot say that they're like someone like created them to be this. You can't say that they are, they were just put there for no reason outside of protecting and breaking down certain minerals that can't be broken down. Because in a world where there's magic, where you snap your finger, you take something to another plane, or you snap your finger and you disintegrate it, why is there these creatures on this plane that not that can that can only break down very specific elements? Not that they can break down all elements. Yes, there are oozes that can break down a lot of elements, but why is it there are these oozes that can very break down very specific elements? Why is it that this ooze can do wood while this ooze can't do wood? But outside the fact is like, because homeostasis is there for a reason. I do like that gelatinous cubes are the most prominent ones. If they're naturally occurring things like the ochre jelly just, just gets through things, it's the sort of thing that would show up in a cave and it just consumes. That's fine. Gray oozes uh, dissolve metal. So it's something where like the dwarves have dug too deep. Well, okay, this is a thing that keeps dwarves out of stuff. Black pudding leaves only stone behind it. It's literally everything else. So it's the same sort of like cave ecology thing. Gelatinous cubes eat meat. Yeah, they leave the bones. They attack adventurers. They are a thing that leaves bone, wood, metal, stone, anything else. The only thing those exist for is killing adventurers. Living flesh critters that came places they don't fucking belong. Killing adventurers or a natural cleaning system for your kill dungeon. Because when you kill the adventurers, you need to scoop <laughs> up all those, but you can't just leave them out to rot. My love of Gelatinous Cube started with Adventure Time. Uh, because there's an episode of Adventure Time where they're going, where Finn is going through a dungeon and he encounters this gelatinous cube in the middle of a dungeon. And you see when he meets this cube, there's a skeleton inside the cube that is slowly dissolving away. And Finn's like, oh, sorry, buddy. I'm gonna need this from you. And he just takes the key from a skeleton that was inside of a gelatinous cube and walks away. And watching that, I don't know what, why, but for some reason, the idea of this monster is just there for a purpose in a dungeon to kill people. There's no other reason. Like there's no reason for a gelatinous cube to exist in a dungeon, except that its purpose was to clean the dungeon. You know how you know a gelatinous cube was made to clean a dungeon? It's a gelatinous cube because it goes through the tunnels and just scoops up any refuge and waste and just cleans the place. Yeah, it has to be like hewn tunnels. Otherwise it would be like the gelatinous oval. Right. <laughs> The first wood elves wandering through hunting deer, they look over and there's this strange thing emerging out of a circular cave and it gets out and there's a little pong sound effect and suddenly, <laughs> why does that have corners? And they just see this gigantic writhing mass of ooze just eating away at stuff and all these other elves like, that's, that's horrible, that is disgusting, I don't get it. But there was one elf who was like, now hold on a second, hold on a second guys, now hold on a second. I know you yelled at me, when I said we should milk the cows. But hear me out, <laughs> hear me out, hear me out. Carl, I see you laughing at me. Hear me out. What if, what if we use this slime to clean our tunnels in our dungeons? There would just be this path, right? Where all the vegetation is stripped and there's just these perfect shiny little rocks like they just came out of a tumbler, you know, just perfect. Like put it in the temple, it'll clean the temple. You get a gelatinous cube to clean your dungeons. You get it to give it that good, like, I just woke up fresh dungeon clean smell. <laughs> but also, you're guaranteed some nice, smooth, shiny rocks in the process. It's an investment that pays for itself. One of my favorite things they call out in the monster manual is how fucked D&D thinks adventurers are at baseline is the idea that adventurers are going out and hunting gelatinous cubes, not because they want the gelatinous cube, but because they're pretty sure another adventurer fucked it up and they can get all their shit. There's always going to be something good in there. That guy, like that gelatinous cube, worthless to me, but it killed a different adventurer and has his wallet. Yes. It's just a floating acidic wallet. Nature's repo, man. It's a floating five second rule. <laughs> 
One of my favorite uses of a gelatinous cube was in a game where I had this old abandoned tower that it had cracked in half and fallen over. And where the top of it once was, a rock had made a nest. And then where the entire center of the tower had rotted out and fallen into the sub-basement, down there was a gelatinous cube. And now all the refuse and cast off bones and meat and other assorted waste that falls from this rock's nest feeds the gelatinous cube that has grown and grown and grown to now fill that entire bottom of the tower. Just this huge pool of gelatinous acidic mass feeding on the droppings from above. have a symbiotic relationship with something else. The time I used a cube was a necromancer. Didn't want to do zombies, wanted skeletons. All right, got a corpse, throw it to the cube, I'll get my bones later. Oh, how convenient. Especially given that it's 10 foot wide, it takes up a whole hallway. Like, you got a blank hallway, you throw a gelatinous cube in it, and like... A gelatinous cube has got to be like a goldfish. It'll grow as big as the tank. Yes, I 100% I yeah. agree with that, yes. So if it's a 10 foot passageway, maybe it's 40 feet long and it's squeezed down. So now it's 10 foot wide, but 40 feet long. I was going to go in the opposite direction. 10 foot wide hallway. You got a booze that's nine feet wide just to make them do the check. You know, players aren't going to fucking wait. Oozes are not meant to be the fun encounter for the early level, early level players. This isn't Dragon Quest. This is not the three slimes on the road. No, these are oozes. These are like straight up hazards. So this is me calling my own self out as a lazy DM in that um, there was one situation where they were in the hallway of a dungeon and there was nothing. You're going through the hallway, but there is this rich acidic smell in the air as you're walking through this hallway. And when you get to the middle of the hallway, that's when you notice the walls are shiny and shiny yeah. because the entire hallway is coated in an ooze. Not that the, the ooze just yeah. took up like like presence in the hallway is blocking you. No, this entire hallway is an ooze. You got to run through it, start running and make your checks as you're running. I also really like the idea of like the, of like the standard wall trap where the walls are moving in, but it's not walls, oh. it's two different oozes. Oh, that is great. Oh my gosh, that is so good. Could you imagine that? Like you just walk into a room and you walk into a room. Yeah, there's just three vents in the room. There's nothing else in this room, just a bunch of three vents. The doors close and suddenly oozes just start flowing in through the vents. Good luck. Good fucking luck. They are great monsters to run, but also they are great weapons. If these creatures existed, they would be farmed and they'd be used all the time. They'd be used in warfare. They would be used in just general utility. They are portable toilets, right? Like, like we would be so used to these things. Every ship would have one because they would just get rid of waste. They would consume all the things that, that would normally bring disease. We would have these things everywhere. They'd be ubiquitous. And then when you ran into them as a monster, it would be even more shocking because you're so, you've gotten used to this thing. You've gotten accustomed to it. It's just a tool. It's a dangerous tool, but so is bleach, right? Like there's lots of dangerous tools that we still use, but if it gets out of control, watch out. Their challenge two, which is like real, real low level, but they have like 80 some odd hit points, an armor class of six, a speed of 15. But if they catch you and you fail your strength save, you are going to take 3d6 damage when the acid damage, when the cube absorbs you. And if you fail a second one, it's 66 acid damage at the start of every one of the cubes turns. Against a level two party, that's, that's a PC. That could party wipe easily. If your table is a heavy role play table, you know, you're all like, we're going on an adventure. We've got our favorite sword and all of our spells memorized and we're together and we're going to find adventure. 
And then you watch someone be dissolved, their skin and flesh just vanish before you and then floating in this transparent gel as their bones and their favorite sword just suspended there forever in a moment. And you have to recover from that and move on. That's something that will scar a party. That will destroy a party. <laughs> It's got no AC. You can hit it as many times as you want. How many rounds does it take a level two party to deal 84 points of damage? It is so slow that when one of your party gets eaten, it is your fault. You yeah. chose to fight this. You didn't even have to run away. You could have briskly sauntered out of the room and you would have been fine forever. But you fought the cube and you didn't win. No one told you to fight this cube. You took it upon yourself. You got greedy. You saw the ring floating yes, inside it. exactly. And you decided to go get it. If you put a fancy gold ring in an empty room, in an empty dungeon, the players will know it's a trap. They will see a trap coming a mile away and they will still pick up that ring. You put that same ring in the dead center of a gelatinous cube, five feet in from all sides. One of those players is going to stop the party and say, we got to get that ring out. There's something in the stat block of the gelatinous cube a lot of people tend to ignore. And this is the scariest thing about the gelatinous cube. And it's right there in the stat block. Transparent. When the gelatinous cube is in plain sight, you need to make a 15, 15 wisdom save just to see it. At level two, you are not making a 15 wisdom save. It is basically just air that you might see a glisten on. So it is specifically a cube that has neither moved nor attacked, but that's perfect because that means you'll walk right into it. And if you're running through a dungeon, if like, and there's lots of reasons to run in a dungeon, but there's nothing better than making them run from one threat and run smack into the next yes, one. Totally, totally. There's nothing saying you shouldn't do that. Or the opposite direction, because again, things that are wonderful about this creature, you, it tries to do the engulf thing. You make your save. Okay, but if you made your save, that means it pushes you five feet. If there's a dead end, or worse yet, the other monster, eventually you're getting engulfed. Or you have to make that decision of like, no, I'm going to try to swim through this fucking thing and try to just get out the far side. There's a gelatinous cube in the tunnel in front of you. There's lava boiling up behind you. There's no time to kill it. There's no time to move it. You just have to plunge through it. Wally, are slimes a monster? The only time slimes are ever, like, dangerous is when someone has taken this slime and just said, I'm going to put this slime right in the middle of your path. That's the only reason people fuck with slimes is because someone went out of their way to make a dungeon and decide to put a slime right in the middle of it. And then I'm going to go even further. Ooblexes. Ooblexes are basically slimes that have been experimented on by mind flayers. They had no ill intent to the rest of the world their entire lives until a mind flayer was like, I'm going to make you evil and have brain powers. The Ooblex is the whole point of the Ublex is that like a bunch of elephants experimented with slimes, jellies, and puddings. Yeah, they just went across the board and they made this super sentient creature that can not only they have intelligence, like the an elder Ublex has an intelligence of plus six, like 22 intelligence right off the bat, but all Ublexes can cast spells. This is the only slime that can cast spells naturally. And the Elder Ublex, it's not just any innate spell casting they have. They have Charm Person, Detect Thoughts, Hold Person, Confusion, Dimension Door, Dominate Person, Fear, Hallucinary Terrain, Hold Monster, Hypnotic Pattern, and Telekinesis. Telekinesis, Kyle! Even if you can't make them walk in to you, you can just be like, all right, fine. <laughs> Grab them and just drag them in. And that's the thing, like, Dominate Person is a terrifying spell under the best of circumstances. I think I hit you with a Dominate Person in the Incubus episode, and it was a fucking moment, and it was just a dude making you sit down. Yeah. 
you know there's an ooze in front of you and it casts dominate person that's the most terrifying thing that happens all campaign but what a great villain speech as you're just frozen there and it's slowly moving to engulf you as it gives it's like and these were my plans all along <laughs> What would you do, Wally, to change the ooze in Dungeon and Dragons? I can't change a single thing about them because they are honestly the most perfect monster. I put them up there with goblins. I put them up there with dragons. I put them up there with giants as a monster that can be used in not just an encounter, but as a plot hook. And it could be used as a it could be used as a symbiotic relationship with a big bad evil. It's it could be used as not just like a fight. It could be used as an obstacle to get around. It's they are they are the DM Swiss Army knife. You can do whatever you want with an ooze, and it will make sense. Every example I've come up with is just make them bigger, make them more situational, but nothing has been about changing them. I agree, they're great. And also, the, it's one of the very few examples in the Monster Mino where a grouped thing, every one of them is interesting. Yeah. Every one of them has their own thing and their own unique way of effing with you. And they're all interesting and varied and not just like this bear hits slightly different. The only thing I might ask to like improve or think that like would make them interesting is the idea of an intelligent ooze every ooze has an intelligence of one except for the ochre jelly which is two except immediately they give us the variant psychic gray ooze which has an intelligence score of six and a psionic crush ability here's my favorite is y'all my favorite ooze is the ooblex because it takes everything i said about an ooze and it turns them into a boss monster so the whole story about the Ublex is that Mind Flayers just one day were just chilling in like their gigantic, you know, fallacious squid ships. You know what? Why don't we just experiment on oozes? I mean, we're not doing anything right now. Why don't we just experiment on oozes and make them smart? It's a Thursday. <laughs> so they just grabbed a bunch of oozes off the off the off the material plane, scooped them up into their ship, and they ran a bunch of experiments on them, and they turned them into Ublex. A totally decadent society like that would make this thing smart because they'd be like, well, it's very helpful for cleaning, but if it could just think for itself and do the task, they would arrogantly make something like that. Exactly. The gelatinous cube calls out that it moves silently in perfect predictable patterns. So it's like a V1 Roomba. But if we could just teach it the layout of the room. <laughs> That's all it is. It's Roomba. It's a big as a big intimidating Roomba. Specifically for meat. <laughs> we gotta call that out. What kind of fuck life are you living that you're like, you know what? I need a Roomba, but for pork. As a podcast network, our first priority has always been audio and the stories we're able to share with you. But we also sell merch, and organizing that was made both possible and easy with Shopify. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell and grow at every stage of your business, from the launch your online shop stage all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell everywhere. They have an all-in-one e-commerce platform and in-person POS system, so wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. With the internet's best converting checkout, 36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms, Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers. Shopify has allowed us to share something tangible with the podcast community we've built here, selling our beanies, sweatshirts, and mugs to fans of our shows without taking up too much time from all the other work we do to bring you even more great content. And it's not just us. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. Shopify is also the global force behind Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Because businesses that grow grow with Shopify. 
Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash realm, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash R-E-A-L-M now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash realm. We were at T minus zero days. No one noticed. There was an experiment running in a wizard's basement. It got out of hand. The wizard, as far as anyone can tell, was probably killed. T plus three days is when the tavern next door was overwhelmed. People started to realize there was a problem. There was an immediate military response. The guard came in. The king was alerted that something strange might be happening, but we don't quite, we're pretty sure we can push him back. T plus seven days, when the barricades were overwhelmed, three blocks out from the wizard's tower. It was realized that maybe the spell isn't shutting down. The city is slowly but surely being overwhelmed. We know by what, it's by oozes, all of them. Cubes. Slimes, puddings, everything. Uh, For the most part, fortunately, we're dealing with cubes. Lots of infrastructure being left intact, but there's also bits of street that that are being torn through. There is a bridge that is on its last legs. If they don't get in there for repairs in a few days, like that's coming down into the river. So, we make a last ditch effort. Everyone gets called into this tavern hall. It's much like, you know, any kind of tavern hall that you've seen in any kind of city um, where adventurers would congregate and sit down and talk about what dragons they killed, what trolls they fought. But this time, this specific hall has been shut down for a private event. You and two other people were instructed, and by instructed, I mean forcibly pushed into this room with bags over your heads and forced into a chair, and the bags were removed from your head, and you see yourself with two other people. And before you get a chance to open your mouth and ask a question, the doors slam open. And inside, walking into the room, is you see a large woman who looks with an intent of look of of seriousness and she knows what she wants and she's gonna break it down to you right now. Also, she's a tabaxi. Big, like, Persian tabaxi wearing a like, straight-up blue pants suit. And they walk in, strutting in like they own the place. They walk in, they sit down at a, in a chair across from you three. And they have three scrolls in their hands. They unfurl the scrolls, look at each one of them. And Aram, why don't you, uh... Describe your character. As the hood is whipped off my head and my big floppy furry ears plop out and I sit back and a foot, big rabbit foot, just slams against the ground. Just a pissed off look. They were pissed in that bag. They're pissed now. They're not scared. They're not worried. They're just mad. This has been done to them before. Four. So he just leans back, pulls a carrot out of wherever, takes a bite. Why don't you cut with the theatrics and just give us the mission, Doc? To Thumper's left is a dragonborn. Uh, there is something the jaw didn't develop correctly. It's wider, it's a little squarer, and the teeth are coming out of it. The moment the hood comes off, just chomping around. On the other side is immediately just a human woman, wide-eyed. Not panicked, just bright. Looking around. Oh, are we doing this again? How many times have I been called into this squad? Um, this is Thumper's third time. How many more times 
how many more times do I have to get called? Like how, like I'm counting now. So how many more missions? Is this a thing that you're like saying out loud? Yeah, that's what I'm asking. How many more? So I've got three, this is three now. I got four fingers, four, all four of my fingers. How many more times? The dragonborn looks over at you and just... If I'm lucky, this is your last one. Waylon, good to see you again. It's never been good. I'm hoping it's the last one. Well, and that makes two of us, pal. Harriet waves to the group of you and immediately one of the guards rushes forward, realizes she got her hands out somehow and just pins them back <laughs> down. <laughs> Waller looks at all three of you, not amused. Harriet, Thumper, Waylon. As you know, the only time I pull you out of your cells is because I have a job for you. Thumper, to answer your question, you have three more jobs. Harriet, five, Waylon, Five also. I did more than either of them. Harriet, the fact that I said the mission was, and I quote myself on this mission, to go into the facility. Did that? Obtain the item and leave the facility. Yeah. You went into the facility. You obtained the item. Mm -hmm. But however, between the moment of you obtaining the item, leaving the facility, I am not sure why you decided to do this, but you decided to have the thought, hey, perhaps, maybe, if I turned on all the sprinkler systems in the building and flooded it, ruining any kind of work that we have put into this operation. Mm -hmm. So yes, it does mean you have five more to go. Didn't say not to. And she just like slumps back into the chair, just pouty. If you have all been briefed on this mission, there was a slime situation that we were dealing with. Gross. T plus seven weeks ago. We're not certain how it happened. We just know the point of origin was in a wizard's tower. We don't know how it happened. We don't know what caused it to happen, but there was a portal in there that slimes are coming out. Oozes of various kinds, puddings, anything you could think of that could run themselves across surfaces and eat away at various pieces of carbon made materials are coming out of this portal and it is causing a lot of danger and destruction within this city we are sending you into this city to close this portal as always she snaps her fingers and you see two humans walk into the room one of them is holding sort of a velvet cushion and on this cushion are three red marbles each one of them you've had this explained to you every time you've gone out, is a bead from a necklace of fireballs imbued with delay fireball. Oh. They go in. They cast a strange little flesh-shaping spell, and that marble is just sealed just at the base of your neck, just where your back sort of comes up. It is never pleasant. It's always a little too warm. And you know, if you don't have that removed at the end of the mission... Right. You and everything in 20 feet is going. For a herringon, for a rabbit creature, for any creature that has fur, just the idea of an acidic, gelatinous, perhaps even sticky like thing would like he's seen one herringon that got hit by one of these, and boy, boy, were those scars frightening. For the first time, you can kind of see his fur rays on the back of his neck, but he bites his lip and he nods and he listens. I can trust that all three of you will accomplish this task. You mean will I do the thing so I don't die? Yeah, Doc. I think I'll do that. And she, like, looks right at Harriet. I'll also do at least the thing. Maybe a couple other things. Maybe that. Well, let's hope that the thing you plan on doing will solve this problem in this city. We're going to need our gear, Waller. She arches her eyebrow because she, he spoke to her in such a tone. And she, like, looks at, her, looks at him like, Oh, do you want your gear is what you're saying. Yes, you'll get your gear. Don't worry, Thumper. You'll get your gear the way that you always get your gear before you go on a mission. Prep time begins now. Meet over at the hangar in T-minus five minutes. And she turns 
and walks out. The hangar being big sarcastic salute. Waylon's just kind of sitting there in the chair, occasionally looking over, looking back down. <sighs> Look, Doc, we got this. We're a team. We've done it before. Don't worry about her. Don't listen to her. Stick with I us. I have great ideas. Not you, her, her, her. Oh, that, yeah. We're together. We've done this before. We got it. Please stop talking. We're the A-team. Oh, God. So, Walla. If the town's overrun by oozes, how are we supposed to get to this wizard tower in the first place? It is a portal. It is a portal, but the portal is like a couple feet off the ground. She definitely had that portal opened right in front of us and then just had us shoved in so we fall that five feet and hit the ground. Waylon just... Waylon is basically just in a pair of pants. <laughs> He's ready for this one. <laughs> Harriet has a mall just a massive hammer that she's just dragging behind her. It's almost it's wrought iron just sparking off the cobblestones. And Thumper has a sling, a rope of climbing, and a bag of magic beads. You are left, let's say, basically 30 feet, enough to basically see the kind of scope of the wizard's tower. From the portal, 10 feet up, you just hear... We think it's in the basement. Try not to die. This city, it is chaos. There are some mounds that don't look like there's some areas of the city that just look like they've been wrecked. Like something is there just crushing large buildings or carriages or what looks like should be a house, it's just flat. When you get up close to it and you kind of like stare at a bit, you notice that it's not empty space. It is actually, there is a big old pile of translucent gelatinous goop just sitting on top of this house. And the more you look around the city, you realize this is the case for many areas. There are these various big, huge globs of translucent gelatinous Group around this city that sometimes you can see it, sometimes you can't see it. But wherever you are in this city, it just looks clean. Like, it just looks like it was eaten away. There are a couple types of booze that eat through metal and stone. It looks like there are places where basically something has moved through and destabilized a structure on the first floor. And a building just like topples over because the northeast like structure has just been melted and it just goes over like a tree. And then there are some places that look like after this damage was dealt to it, something else came behind and just like pressed up against it and just crushed it. So I get a whole bunch of rocks, put them in a bag, and as we're walking along, chuck them forward, chuck them to the side, just every couple steps, toss out a rock in a slightly different direction, and we can see if anything wobbles or sizzles in our path. Then let's make this the first check. If I'm leading it, I'm going to do investigation. I think that's fair. 11 plus 4 is 15. Okay, um, definitely with that, because um, the gelatinous cubes uh, perception is yeah, that's 15. 15. 15, I just yeah. got it. All right, yeah. So you just beat it. So you like fling a pebble, like you fling those, like every now and then you're like flinging these stones to try to like pinpoint where these things are. And after the first stone you throw, you notice that the stone just stops in midair and just slowly floats down to a stop. And that's when you realize there they are. So you kind of like paying attention to what happened there, seeing like the, the way the area looks, you're able to pinpoint throwing rocks where they these need to be at. I don't explain what I do. I just do what I do. So when it does pay off and the others see, I turn to it and go, that's what's up, Doc. And I just keep walking, tossing my rocks. He always says that like it's supposed to mean something. I don't know what's going on over there. Oh, watch out. Puddin'. Puddin'. Oh, no. 
people. Okay, we may break the audience on this one, but let's keep going. <laughs> You're headed towards the actual tower. You landed sort of in a square, maybe 30 feet out, and you've basically just been slowly navigating. These things seem like they are winding through. It is a pure, just Brownian motion. They are ambling outwards. So you're like very carefully having to throw these rocks, watch the clean paths. You know, if it's already been cleaned over, you're probably relatively safe. You know, these things are going for food. And slowly you make your way up to the door. Going straight in, doing any sort of checks or? I would gesture towards, you know, the oaf. There you go. It's a doorknob. Like, is this, I can. Kick it in, Waylon. Just reaches out, just turns the knob and pushes. Oh, no. <laughs> but, like, as he turns the knob and pushes, he's left holding the knob. The inside of the door has been swept clean. He kind of, like, looks at the knob in his hand, just turns back. Feel like you could have pulled that one off? I got it, boys. And Harriet walks in. Right. Oh, I'll walk in after. And you enter the tavern. Wait, what? Is it like one of those like automatic pianos going? Absolutely. Gnomes invented them. <laughs> Halflings invented pianos. Gnomes invented player pianos. Everything outside disaster. We walk into a fully lit player piano tinkling away. It is beautiful. Not a fucking person. Harriet's already walking up to the bar, isn't she? Reaches over. <laughs> hang on. Hey. Like stops mid reach. Yeah. Not a thing. Not real. Come on back. There we go. Look at this. And he's just going to start throwing rocks. Throwing a rock at the glass, a rock at the table, just throwing rocks. All right. Um, I want you to give me an investigation check. 19 plus four is 23. The windows give it away. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing beyond them. Yeah, because you looking, you're looking at this room because like, yeah, you suddenly are back in a tavern. But it's like Dylan said. There's nothing outside of those windows. It is just almost as if someone just painted the outside of what it's supposed to be looking like outside. And like when you walk past the window, you notice that all that destruction and everything, it's not happening outside. So that kind of like triggers something in your head. Yeah. There's also like, the, like there's a reflection of me in the window, but as I walk to the wall, it's the same reflection. It's the same sheen, like, wait a minute. When you toss that first uh, pebble at what you now kind of like sussed out as being a um, an illusion, it goes through it and it vibrates and it shimmers a bit as you have pierced this veil. Um, and as it shimmers away, you see this tavern slowly like it's it's like you're staring at it and you're now realizing someone has done something someone has cast a spell in here because you're now seeing the spell like it like it layered on top of what is supposed to be there and you see the the lobby of this wizard tower but you see this tavern almost as if someone took a layer in photoshop and just dropped it right on top of the scenery and your eyes are adjusting and you're seeing this translucence between the reality of this wizard tower and the and this tavern you're in and the more you look at it the illusion of the tavern it's not like this is just normal magic that was casted no you touch it and it wobbles and it shimmers and it bubbles until it slowly starts to melt down into this red sulfuric looking ooze that just slides down the walls and the, the tavern disappears completely and all that's around your waist is this red sulfuric foul smelling ooze that slides across the floors and goes into any cracks that can get away from you guys okay just but but it melts and just leaves it slides into cracks now, leave would be a generous appraisal. Okay, we gotta run. Yeah, run, run, run! And, like, we are looking for up or down. I'm assuming down, right? Down. You were told basement. Is there a hole? There is a stairway down. And what I'm gonna have you do is I'm gonna have you give me an acrobatics check. Yeah. As you start running, and out of every 
bit of mortar, every crack between a brick, every splinter in a table, red ooze flies out in pseudopods trying to slam into you. I have an idea. Is this, this is the tower I'm assuming with like a staircase all the way around the edge and then just a hollow? Of course it is. It's a, it's a wizard tower. That's what wizard towers do. Then I take a big old running leap and throw out my magic rope of climbing, shout the command word, Albuquerque! And the rope just latches itself around the framework of the stairs. So we'll have a way to rappel straight to the bottom. Okay, give me an acrobatics check. It's a plus eight. And I rolled a two, <laughs> so that is 10. <laughs> so Aram, how many, how many fails do you have? I have one fail now. One fail out of yes. three. So you make this throw, you jump and you swing and you just manage to get it. It's loose. And Harriet's the next one over. Gymnast. She does it nearly perfectly. She swings, she grabs your rope and you realize, the, she realizes at the same time you do. The rope isn't tight enough. It starts to give, but she turns it into a swing and jumps to the far wall. No. Waylon runs, sees the rope slip, stops at the ledge and like looks over. A red pseudopod slams into the back of his head and he topples. He is spinning end over end down the hole in the center of the tower and the fireball goes off. And when that fireball goes off at the bottom of at the bottom where he landed, you hear it. You hear the sound of like hisses, steam. The most foul smelling acidic steam just blasts up this chimney. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You just cough. It is already foul smelling. And to your Harenga nose already, this is too much for you. So you got like 30 feet. You could get down essentially to where that went off. And you can see like the, the ooze has like cleared out a little bit. So you've got a landing pad now. I will climb down with her uh, carefully and, you know, look around. When you get down to the bottom, um, you see the remains of this, of that explosion. You see, sadly, you see the body of Wayland but you also see the remains of that explosion at the bottom of this pit where you now realizing these things do not like fire. That uh, explosion took out a big, like you looking at the bottom of this, of this floor, it looks like there should have been, this entire floor should have just been nothing but ooze and slime. But as soon as that fireball went off, they just were like, no, we need to get away from this. And they scattered away from it. They're not running from you. They're just running away from the fire. All right. Well, I would turn to Harriet. Well, or didn't uh, by any chance give you some fire? I don't do arson. I'm more of a, and she hefts the mall, just like, kind of a smash and grab type. Thumper nods, drops his rocks to the floor and then he pulls out a bag of magic beans. All right, so you're looking around this room and you remember, this is also a wizard's tower. This is not just any tower, this is a wizard's tower. But because of that explosion, you do see there is a little bit of a crack in the ground that leads to where a door would be. Um, you do see this door. You see that this door is a regular wooden door. You kind of like can see cracks through it that there's like this illuminating uh, light behind it. So maybe this is the source of it. Who knows? Um, do you open the door? All right. You ready to go? Oh, yeah. Big, huge rabbit foot. Kick that door in. I need you to give me another uh, deck save here. As you go to kick this door. 14 plus 6 is 20. You kick the door in but as soon as you kick the door in, a wave of slime just falls out of this door. Like think of the shine, the scene in The Shining, when the elevator doors opened up, it is like that. You just see a wave of slime just falls out of this doorway. And it is, it is moving fast, but also kind of slow at the same time. Kind of like, 
oh, oh, why is this slow moving thing moving so fast and quick kind of thing? And it just falls down and starts filling up the room and you are able to like spring yourself away out of the way the last minute. Uh, what about Harriet though? How does Harriet uh, deal with this? So Harriet basically watches this come in and then just starts like, almost like she's sweeping, just swinging the mallet at her feet. And it's just like batting it away and it keeps like flowing back, but she's just sort of gently stepping into each swing. There's almost like a dance rhythm to it. She's whistling. It's a fun game. She like goes to go through the door and then like a pseudopod kind of springs forward, slams into the thing and she just turns and cracks the mallet into the side of the door, shatters a stone. The thing like recoils back and she just shuts the door behind her. Waylon was much better at doors than you are. I'm not going to argue with her. I just nod. Sure, she wants to be right. She wants to be a smart ass. As long as she's leading, I am happy to let her say whatever she wants to say. I'm going to have to learn doors, I guess. So you've entered into possibly the most dangerous terrain for dealing with a gelatinous cube. A long, winding, downward sloping corridor. Every bit of stone is polished. It's dead clean. Uh, as you're like going down, Harriet is just like snapping her fingers and lighting torches as she goes. I'm grabbing one of the torches and I'm going to be carrying it. It, it feels clean. That is unsettling. It's not comforting. As you're like kind of like pushing your way through these winding tunnels, that's when you start to see it start to rise up around your feet. You start to see it's it's nothing at first, but you kind of like start seeing it like kind of like the tide coming in. This brown pudding just start like sliding back and forth. He would just panic, leap, bean in his hand, and throw it down beneath him and pray that something good happens. Yep. Roll your magic bean table. I'm rolling my <laughs> D100 magic bean How table. is that the bit of this that has been most depressing to say out loud? Roll that bean footage. I rolled a 90. So beneath me, a nest of one die four plus three eggs spring up. Any creature that eats an egg must make a DC 20 constitution saving throw. So literally it just summons three eggs, which I assume then immediately dissolve. They are in a nest and that nest melts in towards the shells until they rupture and leak. That's how the pudding eats, correct? Yep. Upon being eaten, they must make a DC 20 constitution saving throw. I'm gonna give that just disadvantage rather than, cause it's gonna, it's eaten all three. Uh, okay, so that's a six plus whatever the con is for this particular type of ooze. I don't think that fucking matters. Uh, it's, it's not gonna be a lot, it's like plus three. On a failed save, the creature takes 10 die six force damage from an internal what? magical what? explosion. Okay, I want you to roll me 30d6. Wait, 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 what? One hundred and twenty-three points of damage. So I want you to give me a dexterity save. That is going to be a 13 plus six is 19. Yeah, this thing pops like a fucking balloon and <laughs> acidic Gross. goop flings oh. everywhere. Oh, no. oh no. I mean, you're a rogue, you got your deck save, everything is good. Harley is dead still. Just pure luck that the worst of it, like she just kind of like flinches a little bit and there's just this bright red scar just burned across the side of her cheek. Uh, you gotta... Got a little something there, Doc. The mall hits the stairs behind you and she just starts walking and there's just the little shh, boom, shh, boom, and just a muttering of the fuck, ah, shit. All right, I believe that puts you at four out of six. We got one fail, four successes. Could still go either way. 
Well, you want to put them in the room where it happened? You see the room where it happened. You see, it looks like a room like a typical wizard's lab. Large space tables all around the edge of the room, various beakers, books, magical doodads and whatnots on the tables. But in the middle of this room, you see this portal and just flowing out of the portal. Like the, the portal is like on the floor and it's just slime is bubbling up and out of it, just over and over again. Every time a slime comes out, regardless of its color, it at least creates this weird little warping. You know, the gelatinous cubes move through and it's like this little distortion in the air. And on the far side, every time between them, you see this roiling mass of ooze and eyes. Were we told how to fucking close this thing? Was that in the briefing? Harriet actually, like, looks down, like, the last little bit of the stairs around, like, this huge lab. Candles, you know, sigils, all that stuff. I'm a bot. Oh, for God's sakes. I dropped out of college. Go to the books, figure it out, reverse the spell, I'll keep them busy. And I'm just gonna basically bounce around this room, flinging magic beans one after the next, trying to keep these things busy while she figures out how to close this damn portal. You're gonna have to tell me what you're rolling to like keep him busy and all that. I want you to roll me her arcana. And what we're gonna do, we're gonna give you proficiency and we're gonna give it your highest mental stat. All right, so I have a 14 intelligence. So that's a plus two. Yeah, so it's gonna be a total of plus four. And what I'm rolling was gonna be, I'm assuming acrobatics bouncing around the room, trying to keep him busy. And then I'll roll my next bean. I rolled a five plus eight is 13. Sending a rogue into a skills test was... Yeah, we kind of should have figured this was how it was going go. Well, otherwise I would just died within five minutes. It had been a very short episode. You do... You are flipping around these various oozes that are flying out, tendrils that are slamming around. You're kind of flipping around them. You're about to throw a bean into one of these. Oozes. Yeah, just loaded just it like, in my yeah. sling. I'm ready, ready to now. go. Yeah. And but then you just get boom, caught in midair, and you're like flailing your arms. You're like, "What's what's happening?" And it's not like you're being dominated. It feels like some other force is just holding you in midair, and they just turn you around in midair, and you see coming out of the portal. You see what looks looks like a humanoid humanoid figure but they are just made of red sulfuric looking ooze as they hold their hand at you and they do that pan motion of like and you get flung pulled towards them it's in a snapping motion and you're like inches away from their face and there's no features on this right on this humanoid looking ooze creature but then slowly it looks it goes from the face of what looks like Waylon for a second and then it goes into the face of random people but then it settles on the face of this old grizzled looking wizard but his beard is now purple and sulfuric color looking and he just looks at you and says like well and who do you think you are coming into here and trying to stop all of what I'm trying to do my people trying to get out of here. We're trying to serve Lord Jubilex. We're trying to break our way into this new realm of pleasure and delight. But you are stopping us, and we do not appreciate that. No, we do not. In the background of that, you can just hear this constant, like, low hum of, Oh, that's bad. I don't We, okay, that's not, oh, shit. I wish I paid attention to that. Cl oh, that is not good. You might want to get a move on there, Doc. And like his every instinct in his body is just to attack right away. But this is buying him time. Look, Doc, we're just here because we had some questions. We we find everything you're doing here fascinating. What what innovations you're bringing to the town? How what forward thinking? We we just want to know uh, what's the plan. Plan simple, my dear boy. See, it's called pure subjugation. 
The Lord Jubilex in all of her might and glory. We praise the great slime that's in above and feeds us all of her mind juices that we praise her greatly. She told us to come and take advantage of this portal and come over here and just move in and take over is what we're doing. So if you don't mind, that is what we'll be doing. We'll be continuing what we're doing and just turning this place into a, how can I put this, uh, uh, an outlet to Jubilex's um, brain. Excuse, excuse me. Oh, yeah, sweetie. Yes, yes. Uh, did you say that the portal wasn't supposed to go to you? No, it was not. Oh, that makes this bit make more. I think I got it. I've heard all I need to hear. There's no part of this sales pitch that has room for a thumper or, frankly, anything. No, there isn't. No, I just I just hurled the next seed directly at this thing's quote-unquote face. So this thing hits you square in the head, and from it, a tree it sprouts. So you just have the entire mass of a tree sprout on your face as effectively you are laying down above a portal into the abyss. Not just a tree, a tree end. Yes. And there's also one more part of this. There is a 50% chance that the treant is chaotic evil and immediately attacks. Okay. Wally, odds are evens. I, I'm gonna say I'm I'm gonna say even. Let's go even. It slams into you. Between your like general sturdiness, you know, you aren't really you're a protrusion. You're not a full blown being. Uh, and just the massive slime oozing behind you, you kind of keep steady. This tree sprouts, kind of leans back, its feet start to melt a little bit, and it bellows in sylvan. It looks down at you, rears back a fist, and just slams it down. There is a ripple, and slowly, like, the thing starts to sink back as this treant is just slamming huge wooden fists that are melting just over and over again into this roiling mass. A tentacle of eyes and hate reaches up and wraps around this thing, basically tries to start pushing it back, and it creates just enough quiet to hear Harriet muttering in old draconic, and then she just grabs this little porcelain candelabra and shoves it off a table. (laughs) It shatters and the portal slams shut. Goop and eyes land next to fragments of broken wood and angry treant head. And from six, seven feet up in the air, a harangan falls and lands on his feet. That was fucking scary. I did not. That was really scary. But they did it, and for the very first time, I killed the monster. This is the first time. (laughs) Is it? I never killed. This is the first time I managed to do it. (laughs) I'm I'm glad I was here for that. (laughs) path out of the wizard's tower isn't easy. There are oozes still around, like sealing the portal didn't pull them all back into the abyss, it just cut them off from a higher intelligence. That being said, once they were disconnected, their movements became more erratic, it made it harder to navigate the tighter spaces, but it also meant they weren't coming after you, they were just like groping at a sense that they had lost. There are some minor acid burns by the time you're done, but you get out. And sure enough, Waller picks you up. You get a quick debrief. Harriet outlines what the portal was, went, what went wrong. There was some pronunciation that got messed up. It should have been pronounced as if it were written in Auron, but it was pronounced as if it were written Terran. That's the problem with the elemental languages. And well, of course, tells her to shut the fuck up. She doesn't care anymore. Hearing her explain that would be hilarious, too. Just yeah. in that accent would be amazing. Oh, yeah. They got all the accents wrong. Like, yo, did they? <laughs> <laughs> it just dawned on me what you meant by that. <laughs> 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 
you're given this explanation. You, you sit down and you give the debrief and you get to the end Waller nods and commends you all on a job well done. At which point the world goes black again. Several hours later, you're back in your cell. You're told you can remove the hood. You come down and you're left there until the next time you're needed. I reach over with my one pencil and I draw one more line on the wall. And I sit back, put my big rabbit feet up and just stare at those marks. If you want to suggest creatures for future episodes or talk about the monsters we've discussed on the show, head on over to our Discord. You can find links on killeverymonster.com. And we'll see you next time for Kill Kill Every Every Monster. Monster. In high school, we played a game. Many years later, we got back together to play one more. Little did we know, this time, the game was real. Join me, Aram Vartian, on Start Playing Games for a brand new type of fantasy role-playing. In Die RPG, you play a group of real-world, deeply flawed adults who are transported into a fantasy realm via a predatory, sinister role-playing game. The game transforms your characters into paragons and rewards them with strange and frightening powers. In Die RPG, you are confronted with your truest desires and deepest fears. And only you can decide when the game is over. Check out all of my available Start Playing Games campaigns at aram.gay. This show was produced and edited by Dead Ghost Productions. Find out more about us and all the shows we make at deadghostpro.com. Deadghostpro.com